Good morning. Uh, welcome to CSIS. Uh, we are having um, probably the last event of the summer here, and so I'm grateful for you all coming out on a particularly hot day. Uh, on the other hand, we're not going to talk at all about the conventions, so you've got to look on the bright side. Um, we are going to talk about workforce and shortage and how to change that. And so the schedule to, for today is that we'll have uh, Deputy Undersecretary Phyllis Schneck, who most of you know, of course, uh, provide opening remarks. We'll then follow up with remarks from Candace Worley from Intel Security. Phyllis will then take questions, and then we'll have a panel discussion with uh, Phyllis and other panelists who will be introduced to you later. Um, the study we did is kind of interesting. It was a global survey, uh, and some of the results we got were unexpected. I mean, when you send a survey out, you never know what you're going to get back for people. Um, one of the things that I didn't expect was we asked um, executives around the world, you know, what are things that you find as useful for building cybersecurity skills and for building a workforce? And they said three or four things, which the, the speakers will tell you about. But the one that stood out for me, and I'm going to do a spoiler here, is um, they said gaming. <laughs> gaming experience was useful for building the cybersecurity workforce. So those of you who played Pokemon Go on the way over, we have, a, we have an opening for you. Uh, <laughs> let me introduce our speakers. Um, Phyllis Schneck is the Deputy Undersecretary for Communications and Cybersecurity in the National Protection and Programs Director at NPPD of uh, DHS. And she's the Chief Cybersecurity Official for the Department of Homeland Security. I'm not going to read her whole bio because it's longer than the actual report. Phyllis has done so much in her life that it's incredible. Um, she was previously at McAfee, where she was the CTO for the global public sector. Um, she has been worked on our commission eight years ago on the cybersecurity for the 44th presidency. She was chairman of the board of directors for the National Cyber Forensics and Training Alliance, which many of you know, which was a partnership between law enforcement and corporations. Um, she was the chairman of InfraGuard, the FBI uh, episode. I'm just giving you the highlights, by the way. Um, top in, Information security's top 25 women leaders in information security, uh, I think repeatedly. And uh, she was long career in the private sector before McAfee. And of course, a uh, doctorate in computer science from Georgia Tech, where I just was, nice campus. <laughs> so, uh, an immense uh, set of skills there. And I was kidding uh, Candace on the uh, way in that, you know, she needs to pad out her uh, biography a little more, but Candace is also one of the leading experts in information security. She's the Vice President for Enterprise Solutions and Marketing in the Intel Security Group at Intel Corporation. Has been uh, both at Intel and prior to that McAfee for uh, 16 years. Uh, recognized throughout the industry, uh, well-known speaker to many of you, um, tremendous abilities in predicting future trends, which is one of the things I can hope we can talk about today. We were talking about it a little bit beforehand. Um, let's see. I think I'll stop there, and you can say more. So we have two very uh, powerful speakers to open the event, and then we'll go to the panel. I think what we'll do is, uh, if Phyllis has time, uh, she will stay and take uh, a few questions. Uh, if time permits. So with that, Phyllis, please. Thank you. Good morning. So it really is an honor to be here. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for all the many years of getting to work with you and all the work you've done in this field. Uh, thank you to the audience for being here. I know this isn't your day job, so I appreciate the fact that you're going to get 500 emails later you get to read because you were here. Uh, but I appreciate the effort you put to this. It's a really important topic. Uh, many thanks to Intel Security for writing the report to Sal for all the work that goes into, Sal Viveros for all the work that goes into uh, making sure that the world can see the, the good work, um, to Patrick Flynn, who I've known for many years and could make jokes about, but I won't, because Patrick's done a lot of work uh, for this industry as well, including making sure some of the public-private partnership uh, meetings at the cabinet level had gotten set up correctly out west. And finally to Candace, who many of us uh, looked at as a role model when I was at McAfee and Intel. So it's, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a humbling experience to talk about what we really need um, so much. So what I was going to share is a little bit of what we have in the department, um, where we're going in cyber, and why we need such a strong pipeline going forward. We need to come to this thing with all we've got. Many of you have heard me say before, uh, the cyber adversary has no lawyers. How many lawyers in the room? Yeah, so no offense. The cyber adversary has no way of life to protect, no laws they have to follow, nothing they have to do right. 
In many cases, they have plenty of money, and all they have to do is execute, and they only have to be right once. We protect a way of life. We look at cybersecurity as it intersects our electric grid, our railways, our water, our banks, and everything we do. If I can't eat it, it's probably lit up and electrified, and that means we have to protect it. And so we have to make sure that going forward, it's not about blocking everything. It's exactly as Jim said was referenced. It's gaming it. It's understanding where the risk has to get managed, uh, how you build things that can react while under attack, and how we make our world more resilient so when the cyber adversary launches something in, um, two things happen. One is we've removed all the noise, so we'll, we'll actually notice it and be able to address it. And two is when it does come in and intrude and try to execute someone else's instruction on your computer and make something bad happen, uh, your computer will either prevent it or notice it. And when it notices it, it needs to tell everybody else, see something, say something. So what we do in the Department of Homeland Security is look from the cyber perspective, is look at how we make technology more enjoyable, how we can keep things like consumer electronics a lot of fun, how we can look at this explosion in Internet of Things as a really good thing, because going forward we have to protect all that technology and encourage uh, the private sector to innovate. And I'm from private sector, so I'll say private sector to make a ton of money innovating, because then you'll get to innovate more and make better things for us in government and others around the world to consume, uh, so that our infrastructure is self-healing. My vision, our vision, the vision I brought into the Department of Homeland Security and briefed our secretary on about three years ago when he came in was the self-healing ecosystem. Help the cybersecurity and the connected ecosystem work like the routing system. When you send traffic, you go from machine to machine to machine. If one machine is unavailable or sick or not working, there are protocols that alert everybody of that. It allows a human to replace the machine, but nothing stops. And that's how we have to work in cybersecurity. So they made jokes with me at my going away party at McAfee about, you know, what are you doing when I announced I was going to government? And I will say I walked into the finest team on the planet. I have 2,000 of the finest scientists I've ever known. Uh, I oversee all the cybersecurity and operations, so the incident response, the 24-7 operations center, the ability to rip apart malware and potentially know where it came from, uh, the work in partnership, in outreach, in education, in training, um, and all that is cybersecurity and communications on the operations side. We work hand in hand with folks that are not in our directorate and the law enforcement side. So our federal law enforcement partners, uh, U.S. Secret Service, which is part of the Department of Homeland Security, Homeland Security Investigations, which is part of ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, which is part of Homeland Security, and certainly our brothers and sisters in the FBI and intelligence community. Uh, so how do we do this? We need more people. I need to grow that team. And part of the challenge has been, as we look at this, this is a top, top priority. It's a priority to my boss, Under Secretary Suzanne Spaulding, and it's a priority to her boss, Secretary Johnson. It's a top priority to President Obama, as he put this in the uh, Cybersecurity National Action Plan. So a lot of the things that we're doing is looking at what could we do as a department to make uh, not only attracting folks to our department easier, but how do we actually bring them on? So when I first came in, we looked at I looked at what are the things on our team that are just amazing and great, and I'm still making that list. It's an incredible group. But what I've discovered is when I go out, and, and less, less often than it used to be, but people, number one, didn't know what the department did in cybersecurity, uh, and number two, they had no idea how to get into government. So we're trying to make that easier in two ways. One is get out more and talk about what we do. We are the folks that got on airplanes. My team got on a plane and went to the Ukraine when a quarter, quarter million people lost their lights right around Christmas. Right? We talk to governments all over the world. You, wrote, you report with governments all over the world, and many thanks to those, Amir, who participated, and others with that. But how do we make sure that people know what we do so that if they think about working for government, they can actually think about working for the department or other parts of our government? Number two, how do we make it easier? I gave a keynote to about 500 people in Silicon Valley two years ago, and somebody actually raised their hand and said, um, are you trying to steal our people? And I kind of laughed, and I said, well, you pay them four times what I can right now, so if I do steal them, I'm really flattered by that, and cool. Um, but I do want to take people. But we will talk about that in a few minutes. We, we don't want to steal out of the private sector. We want to create a new trend where a career, and I'm learning from a lot of the, love this word, millennials, is that this is the preferred way, whereas my grandfather worked at one company for 50 years and got a watch when he retired. The new careers do several different tours of duty in several different places, and we're hoping that some of that will be in government for the skills that you create, the skills that you will learn, and then the skills that you bring back out to the private sector. So we've spent a lot of time with our outreach folks. Herb Josie is here, one of our top experts in how we actually communicate with folks, not in Klingon, and how we work with the press. 
but we really want to get at 24-7 response and mitigation, that high energy, that this is not yesterday's government, that we have people that can communicate what they do. We have people that are the best in the business uh, that are constantly learning. They go upstairs to the skiffs and see things that you'd never see anywhere else. But how do we attract people to that with the salary differentials? And so we've been looking at that. You know, number one, uh, the mission can usually draw. I would hands down say this is the best experience I've ever had in my field. Um, you get to see and do things and affect change and do positive things in ways you'd never imagine. And one of the first things I realized when I came into government was, as they started to show me things, how much government does so that somebody like me never had to know about it. But how do we show that to folks? So the department itself uh, is looking at several different things. One is to streamline the hiring process. So there are things that we can't control. For example, how long it takes to get a clearance or how long it takes to go through some of the other vetting processes. But there are things we can control. And our management directorate, management's another part of the Department of Homeland Security, as is the Secret Service or the TSA, who you all know from the airport. Please smile at them. Their job is hard. Uh, uh, FEMA, but management runs for us the financials and the way that our department runs. Many important functions, such as our CIO, are there. And what they're doing is saying, what are the processes in hiring that we can make faster for you? So for example, if there's a long queue, moving somebody past somebody that for some reason is not going to advance in the queue very quickly, finding ways and automated processes to move those people forward. Uh, tracking people. So I, I made a couple of key hires when I came in, and I actually, believe it or not, both of those people were already in government. I called them every couple of weeks to make sure that they knew we were still interested. So even though the process takes a long time on some of the clearance sides, making sure that we give some customer service, just like HR and a company would do, reaching out to people. Uh, but overall, also making it a lot faster, streamlining some of the processes, automating some of the processes, um, things like what they call a TJO, a temporary job offer. Um, today and tomorrow, 27, 28 July, we're having a big job hiring fair downtown at the Omni. Right, we're going to be able to hire people on site. And assuming they pass all the backgrounds and the clearances, we can bring them in. We're also looking at ways to say, for your first uh, few weeks on the job when you may not need a clearance, can we do some concurrent processing? No one needs a security clearance to process your insurance forms and figure out where the office is. So can we do some things concurrently so we can make these processes move a lot faster uh, and bring people in? As we look at the transformation, that's, that's a, a word that we use for really changing the National Protection and Programs Directorate in, in one key way. Uh, making sure that our teams that focus on the cyber response and our teams that focus on the physical response have an org chart that enables their efficient response in the field. So combining the cyber and the kinetic sides of things, which I know there was a report on this about two years ago in a venue similar to this, but looking at when we do a response such as the Ukraine, you need folks that understand how to keep 60 gig on both sides of the grid so you don't have a big ball of light somewhere. And you also need the folks that understand the IP protocol to figure out if one of the monitoring systems went wrong. And we want to make sure that we can bring our cyber and our real world systems together in a more efficient way. As we do that, we're hoping to attract people that say, yes, that's something that I want to do. I see an application for cybersecurity beyond the purely technical that I hear about in the news. I see where cybersecurity goes into my actual way of life. Um, we're looking at how the findings of this great report are going to help us influence in government how we do hiring, how we talk to people. There are some great graphs in the report. I, re I recall one that shows how people focus and care most about it seems promotion and training. So as we look at that, how do we show people their actual career path? One of the things that I did when I came in is I deliberately hired executives to work for me that are technical because I discovered that my top skilled people respected them more than leaders that aren't technical. So in order to create a career path, we have to focus now in government on showing those, those top skilled people, those cyber ninjas as we call them, there's a career path for you that doesn't require you to decide, I go into management and leadership, uh, or I stay technical. You should never have to make that choice. You should be able to do what you do best and also go into leadership so that you can lead others and working on the promotion path that way too. We're looking on, focusing on areas on cybersecurity spending, education programs, um, looking at the dynamics of our actual environment and anything that can illuminate for us and for our employees how to make government not only a more attractive place to go, but again, an easier place to understand how to come into. Um, our federal workforce, as we look at some of the programs, we have Rodney Peterson here who's running the NICE program, looks at training, and I'll have Rodney talk more about that, but you can look at 
um, current cyber professionals, those who are looking to enter the cyber field, people with an IT background, uh, people that want to get certifications, um, or IT professionals in the federal, state, or local, or in the law enforcement arenas, we want to bring that in, and helping some of the veterans programs know how to target their folks into the cybersecurity part of government as well. And there's a great program within uh, ICE and Homeland Security Investigations that actually uh, teaches wounded vets cybersecurity. And I got to meet some of that, that graduating class when I first came in back in 2013. And these are amazing, smart people. So we're trying to bring in more and more of this mind share. So we are currently recruiting. You all know usajobs.gov, but I feel obligated to put that out there. But I'd also offer the hiring fair is a little bit of a faster and more direct way as well, because you'll meet our people right there on site today. Uh, you'll meet a lot of the folks that are doing the hiring, and they could actually get temporary job offers for folks that come in today. We have a cybersecurity internship program. I've met a lot of high school students, been able to show them our operations center. So we've found ways to bring students in. I, I spoke to a group called Girls Who Code. If you can imagine what it might be like to clear about 30 18-year-olds into a classified operating center. I credit my team with that one. But enabling folks that have taken, and, and young women that have taken a whole summer, and they're not nerds to learn how to write computer code. They're like Candace, they're cool. They just wanna do something that, that does good things and is highly technical and they're really smart. So how do we show them that world in a way that they've never seen before? We have the Secretary's Honors Program, which is also a very, very competitive program for entry-level professionals that come into DHS. And we do a lot of work in helping people, again, on career paths. How would you aim at every different part of your career? What do you wanna do? What do you wanna focus on? And how do you aim towards someone to, go, someone to go towards senior executive service, which they call SES? And we actually do a lot of mentoring with our students and our employers and how to, employees, and how do we help them get to those right places? Um, one of the first times I realized how much students light up and how much people light up when they don't see what's going on on the inside and all of a sudden they do, was right after I briefed uh, our new secretary back in the winter of 2013. And after he got the briefing on my vision and our vision on where we were gonna go with cybersecurity over the next few years, he said, where did you go to school? And I said, Georgia Tech. And at that time, I didn't realize, one of his staff members had told me he didn't like PowerPoint. And so we went to the ends of the earth, because you're in a skiff. We didn't have a lot of choices on how we could present, um, to get markers and paper. I didn't know at that time that, that he did actually like PowerPoint. Somebody was mistaken. He thought it was utterly ridiculous that as highest tech people were writing in magic markers. But he said, so Georgia Tech, he said, huh, he said, okay, I wanna go down there, I wanna meet where you came from. And so he planned a day where he also gave a, a big speech at Morehouse, his alma mater down in Atlanta. They welcomed the new president, and we visited both schools. And I must have talked to about 100 students. I was able to bring in our cabinet secretary of the Department of Homeland Security who enjoyed every moment of seeing the research projects, meeting the students, um, asking me about the Google Glass that one gentleman was wearing. Um, another gentleman came up to the secretary and, and bragged that he was a Bitcoin operator. This was fun. I did a lot of explaining in the car on the way back. Uh, but it was a good time also to watch the students say, wow, this really goes on in government. And government came here, and these people uh, pretty much came and just wanted to talk to us and see what we do and hang out. And they're not all stodgy and stiff, I hope. Um, and the students said they had a very good time. And it was at that, that point I realized we need to find a way to attract these people because all the students I met with were very interested in coming to figure out how we could be a part of their career path forward or their research path forward. And at that point, I didn't have a good answer as to how we would bring them in. And my sense is today we have a much, much better answer. And this report's going to help us as a society figure out how to build a bridge between government and private sector. Uh, the pin that I'm wearing, the secretary gave me last week, two weeks ago, when we actually filmed uh, a discussion, a candid discussion about hiring and workforce and why I came here and why he came to government. So it really does remind me, and that's why I wore it today, of his commitment and my boss's commitment, Suzanne Spaulding's commitment, to making sure that we get the absolute best and the brightest. We do some amazing work. There is nothing my team can't do. There's no adversary they can't figure out. The team just isn't big enough. I want to get the best and the very, very brightest. We will make your job a lot of fun. Uh, and that goes into a very special program that my boss worked on with Chris Young of Intel. And her thought and his thought was, what can we do to do a joint program between private sector and government you know, that enables people to get the financial benefit of working in the private sector, get that chance to innovate and build big things and understand the corporate side and the sales side, the importance of building and shaping a market, how do we also let them have this experience in government? 
and see things they've never seen before. I can tell you that being in our shop makes your skills the sharpest. Uh, to, trains you that you really don't need to sleep, that's overrated, uh, but you will constantly run, you'll constantly be excited, and you come out of that shop the sharpest you've ever been in your career. How can we give those skills to young students, let them transfer those over to the private sector so you do a tour of duty in government, a tour of duty in private sector, and kind of go back and forth with a couple of really good options here. One is uh, we'd figure out a way to pay for the education in return for the service to government. We would figure out a way to help them in a career path that would be mentored and guided by both the government and the private sector. Uh, we would build on the success of a program that we've had a lot of good, good results from called Scholarship for Service that we co-fund with the National Science Foundation. I speak at that almost every year, and there must be a thousand students that come to that dinner, uh, and they actually listen to our talk before the food, so I know they're interested but they have always come to us and said, all the ones that have come to DHS have come back to us and said, I want to come back. So we want to build on the success of that and say, can you build programs that let people go between the government and private sector? Our management director calls this a passport. So you might not have to do all of your forms again and go through all that vetting again. You just kind of go in and out. Um, and how do we build that professional so that we have a new, new way, a new career path that is high impact, uh, highly promotional, and enables people to, if we do it right, they'll be making the most money when their kids go to college, so that it's not a financial issue, but you see the best of industry, you see the best of government, and you can bring the best of both to each world. Um, one other thing that we're doing inside DHS that I think can transfer here is we found a way with our authorities given to us by the Hill to use direct hire. So if you want a cybersecurity job and you're really good, we can actually hire you without you going through the website process. We have folks on the team that really put together, uh, I would say very quickly, as soon as we got the authority, what they call cyber pay or incentive pay. So the people on the team that meet certain criteria actually got more money. We've been giving out bonuses to people to make sure that they feel that they have a career path. It's a great way, as you know, in private sector, to show appreciation. Uh, when we have coffee and cookies in the office, it's because somebody bought them personally. So we have no real way to show appreciation, but we can try to do this with our cyber pay, our incentive pay. We've had some very good results from that from a morale perspective as well. But I'm very excited about what Suzanne Spaulding and Chris Young are putting together. I think it's a trend-breaking, groundbreaking kind of move where you change a career. You create more people like Candace. And you also give them government experience and private sector experience and let them bring both to each. And I think that will create, uh, along with more diversity, I'm very big on, I understand that. If you look at our adversary, it's global. All of us, all countries have a global adversary. That's a diverse adversary. If we address that with one demographic, one gender, and one kind of person, we are at a disadvantage. So I like to make my teams as diverse as possible. So if we focus on that with the different experiences and careers, uh, we will cause a lot of pain to a very large adversary. So thank you very much to CSIS, to Jim, and to all who wrote this great report. So Candace is cool. I was talking to her before the event, and so uh, I'm really eager to hear what she has to say and maybe see what she says in the panel. But before Phyllis sits down, the average lifespan of a political appointee in the federal government is 18 months. That means half of them leave after 18 months. Um, how long have you been there? Uh, three years in September. Three years. And um, so you're doing double the average. Uh, it's a tremendous sacrifice, especially for someone like Phyllis. So let's give her another round of applause for what she's done. <laughs> Thank you. I work with great people. It is truly enjoyable, so thank you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes, it's a difficult job, and it's a lot of sacrifice, so thank you. Uh, Candace, you want to come up? So thank you. Uh, as the previous folk said, thank you for coming today. I know you're all very busy. I also want to thank Phyllis. Um, she and I worked closely together when she was with McAfee, and... Um, Having known her skills and her capabilities, I just want to say that I'm thrilled to death that she's in public service and she's involved in cybersecurity at a federal level. Uh, frankly, I sleep better at night knowing that because I have incredible admiration and respect for her capabilities. And you should all be thankful that she has taken this role and is helping us keep this country safe. 
So I also want to thank CSIS for the great work that they've done with us. They've been a longtime collaboration partner with us. We've worked with them on a number of reports that we've created. And I think this latest one around the talent gap is extremely important and it's very relevant to where we're at right now as a market. There's been a lot of talk in the industry for the last couple years around, you know, do we have a talent shortage? Um, and I think part of why we decided to do this report is to kind of you know, put that question to bed. I think many of the customers that we work with, many of the agencies that we work with, feel that there's a talent shortage because they have difficulty filling the roles that they have open. But we decided that we really wanted to put um, kind of an exclamation point at the end of that sentence and say there is absolutely a talent shortage. 82% of the respondents of this report concur that they have an extremely difficult time filling the roles in their organization and that they have a cybersecurity talent gap in terms of capabilities and knowledge and being able to get the right folks into their organization. Now, there's some fairly significant implications to that. When you have open recs, when you have positions that are not filled in your cybersecurity organization, in all probability, that means either the people that you have on staff are working 24 hours a day, which means they're headed for burnout, or they're probably you know, not quite as um, alert the next morning as they might have been had they got a good night's sleep. But it also means that there's probably things that are not getting done. So when you have open positions, you're probably going to look at the things that are least critical, not that they're not critical, they're least critical, and those are gonna be the things that get traded off because you can't ignore an incident that's occurred. You have to do the incident response. You can't ignore a potential breach that you suspect may have occurred, but you might delay that patching of the operating system or the application. Delaying a patch of an operating system or an application is an incredible gift to the hacking community because it is one of the primary ways they actually use to get into an organization and penetrate that ecosystem or that, that uh, network. And so the talent shortage is, in fact, putting organizations and companies at greater risk. In the survey, we had about 71% of the survey respondents that felt that their inability to get the right talent and find talent to fill their roles is, in fact, increasing their security risk as an organization. Many of them reported loss of data as, as one of the potential risks uh, any kind of security incident also has reputation implications, either for the agency or the corporation. Um, that gets into the press, it gets into their, you know, gets to their customers that there's been a breach, and they have a lack of trust in that organization from a security perspective. So there are significant implications when you're unable to have a full staff that's doing kind of everything from what I call the janitorial of security, patching updating DATs, upgrading the current applications to a later version, um, all the way to responding to critical incidents, making sure that your network is as impenetrable as possible. So there's serious implications for this. Now, I, I personally thought one of the most interesting things was that 50% of the respondents required a technical degree. They wanted a degree in computer science or mathematics. And having uh, been in this industry for 16 years without a technical degree, um, I found that a rather interesting statistic because I've, I've had a fairly you know, good and long career in this industry despite the fact that I didn't get a computer science degree. I have a management degree with a minor in behavioral science. I would assert the psychology degree has served me much better than the business degree in this particular industry because there's a lot of psychology when it comes to hacking and, and kind of penetrating um, organizations. So as I looked at that degree, I also noted that what companies were saying or survey respondents were saying is although they want that technical degree, they had two or three things that were more important to them than the technical degree. One was real world experience, the other was professional certifications, and the third was things like hacking competitions. So although they required, most of them required a technical degree, it was kind of the third priority for them in terms of looking at a candidate to determine whether or not they were the best candidate for the job. Things like that professional experience, hacking competitions, and professional certifications, they actually ranked more important. So kind of an interesting dichotomy. I really want a technical degree, but boy, if you don't have experience or hacking competitions or pro uh, professional certificates, maybe you fall further down on my recruitment list. So, so kind of an interesting statistic that came out of this survey.
And I think especially, you know, given that we're in Washington, D.C., and, and many of you are involved with, with kind of government and agencies, you know, the respondents also felt universally across the globe that governments could be doing more, that they were not doing enough to help build the cybersecurity talent funnel, that uh, governments could play a more active role. I think, you know, Intel security, uh, to Phyllis's point, is being very proactive in terms of trying to work in partnership with governments, as well as, frankly, with some of our customers and with other vendors in the industry to try to figure out how do we solve this problem and build this, the security talent pipeline. We work with a number of universities. We work with some of the government agencies in putting together programs that will help to try to drive that, that pipeline development. I think we're also doing things at a very young age. So we have a program where we have uh, a set of materials that our employees can volunteer to use, go out to their local schools, and teach online uh, security to elementary students, junior high students, and high school students. I personally have not had the courage to go to the high school and teach it yet, because you know, oftentimes those guys are as educated on, on security and, and uh, computers as most of the folks in our organizations. But you know, that elementary school and junior high, getting them aware that cyber is an issue, that being online is an issue and they need to be concerned about that, starts to plant that seed in their mind that computers are more than you know, the gaming console, they're more than social chat, that there are implications to being online. And hopefully planting those seeds so that when they get to high school and college, we can have that discussion with them about cybersecurity as a career. Um, I spoke with a group of women at um, New York's Polytechnic Institute a year or so ago, and they were trying to get more women to go into their cybersecurity program. And one of the things I told them is, you know, this is a career where you don't just go to work every day, but you get to go to work and be a hero and a warrior and a caretaker and a teacher. And, and this is a career where you, you play a number of personas because the industry itself and our ability to respond to the attackers mandate that. You know, when a major incident happens, you have a customer on the phone, they're having a meltdown because it's the reputation of their company and their personal career at risk. You turn into a caretaker pretty darn quickly, right? And so I think that this is an industry where, as we're talking to young folks about entering this space, there's an opportunity to, to create those personas in their mind that make it feel like it's not just about sitting at a keyboard. So I think we have an incredible opportunity as an industry in partner with government, in partner with our comrades in the um, security space and with private industry to work on solutions to build this talent pipeline. And I'm extremely excited about uh, working on those programs and helping to drive this initiative forward. So hopefully you'll enjoy this report. Hopefully you'll find it useful. And thank you again very much for coming today. So we have time for a few questions. Uh, I think we have microphones in the back, and um, if you have a question, uh, hold up your hand. Uh, I'll start by saying there's two things. I have two questions, actually. The uh, first question is, and it's for both of you, and I think because of you have a mic, you're going to have to come up to the podium, Phyllis. How have you seen the workforce change uh, in the time you've been, you've been in cybersecurity? What's different about it now than it was when you both came in uh, a few years ago? So I don't know, Candace, do you want to go first? Uh, I'll say, you know, I, and I, I plan to mention this and you kind of forgot it, was that I work, I work with a lot of people who don't have a technical degree and some don't have a degree at all. So I've worked with astronomy majors, geography majors, anthropology majors who were coders, who were writing code, developing, you know, basically security applications. Um, incredibly talented, committed, passionate people who simply had created you know, a hobby of computer programming. And they turned that into a career. And I think that um, over time, as I think that the report kind of indicated, that whole degree in computer science kind of became more important, because those were people that I knew very early in my time with McAfee. Now, as I look back even you know, just five or 10 years ago, having that degree has become such a critical part of hiring someone. And I think that maybe it overshadowed a bit all of the great talent that's out there that has gained their skill sets through alternate means. Um, so I think there's been an evolution of that. Certainly there's been an evolution of the attacker. Um, you know, if, if I think about the attacker when I first started, 
you know, they were script kiddies. That was, you know, the, the typical term for them way back then. You know, 18-year-olds uh, sitting in their basement trying to, like, get their, their piece of malware on the front page of a newspaper somewhere. Um, that adversary has changed dramatically. I mean, we're talking um, organized, organized hacking. And I'll, I'll just leave it at that, where you know, our adversaries are as well-funded as we are, as educated as we are, as organized as we are. And that means that the talent pool that we have to tap has to be capable of thinking in a way that our adversaries think. And that's where I think the gaming comes in, right? So if you think about the gaming angle, um, you know, I, I watch kids. I watch, kids, my husband and my brother, um, as well as our children, um, you know, gaming, and, and it takes massive deductive reasoning. It takes the ability to see, you know, multiple things going on at the same time and determine which of those are the most important for them to take action on. And, you know, we, we kind of joke about gaming, and yet when you think about what it takes to play some of those games, it is, it is incredibly difficult multitasking, deductive reasoning, have to be, you know, very quick at making decisions. When you think about what you've got to do to be in the cybersecurity career or field, a lot of those skill sets actually apply. And so I think it's an untapped um, talent pool that uh, we ought to be encouraging those kids who love to game to consider this field. Maybe our next study ought to be on gaming. I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> Go ahead, tell us, please. Uh, thank you. So I agree with this one? I think it's on. Yeah. It's on, yeah. It's on. Now it's on. Ah. So I agree with everything Candace said. I'll say when I, when I started this, I grew up in technology. My father was a computer scientist for NASA. And I just had punch cards. I, didn't, I wasn't old enough to use them, but I ate them. And so I grew up around computers and blinky lights. And to me, this is, this is where the cool factor was. But I soon realized that I was probably the only girl that can write computer code. And I recall in a college class, my uh, roommate, who this day is my best friend, came and brought half the lacrosse team of Johns Hopkins to see me writing code at some ungodly hour of the night in the lab, uh, but I think it's all changed since then. It's not about um, writing thousands of lines of code and managing a firewall, and it's just so far beyond that. And to Candace's point, the spectrum of what you need to be in this field, first and foremost, if you want to look at how this field has changed, our deputy secretary, Deputy Alejandro Mayorkas, went to DEF CON and did the keynote last year. I brought him, assuming this was either going to be awesome, as it was, or a career-limiting event. Um, he was incredible, and he stole the stage because he said, we want, we need to work with you, and I'm here to partner, and we are actually bringing in, as he announced that day, you know, a hacker in residence. And, and that doesn't mean someone that we think is going to hurt government. That means someone from that crowd and that team with those amazing skills opening the doors to what has been previously perceived as government and for whatever people think of it as saying, this is just another team a team of people that have a, a different mission and different access to different things, but we want and need to work with you. And there's a whole spectrum of skills we need. I tell people, I did a commencement speech at Johns Hopkins recently, and I tell people, uh, you have highly technical skills. You all could come out and build the next great widget. Uh, please learn to communicate. Uh, I learned a lot of this from uh, Tom Gann and Trish Remo when I was back at, at in, in the company, but you have to learn to speak non-Klingon. You may understand how that instruction was stolen and how the malware worked and all the cool words, but nobody else among the decision makers to whom you have to explain this uh, does. So when you find yourself, as I have, sitting in the situation room, you know, sitting in the back, uh, making sure that you're there so that your principal, either the undersecretary or the deputy, has what they need, or you find yourself in a meeting where you are at the table, you're the person, you have to be able to convey what happened in a normal language. And the second skill I think you need is to understand how to build teams. You can be the smartest person in the room, but if you can't work with everybody around you, we could have the best workforce on the planet. If they can't all work together in some way, it's not going to work. So the gaming skills, I think, and the people skills need to come together uh, hmm. with the hardcore tech. And that's a lot of how it's changed. Just, just as a footnote, uh, Australia's uh, survey form has a space where you can fill in you know, your ethnic group, and it allows you to fill in whatever you want. So 25,000 Australians on the last survey filled in that they were Klingon. Uh, so oh, there, is an, uh, there is a market, uh, not in the US. But um, <laughs> maybe building on something uh, Phyllis said that I was thinking about. I was on a panel in the Naval Academy uh, a little while ago, and it had uh, two admirals and a general. Uh, they were all women. Uh, I got to talk to the head of 10th Fleet, which is uh, Navy Cyber Command. Uh, she's a three-star admiral. 
Um, when you think about DHS, the two top leaders are Phyllis and Suzanne, right? When you think about it, the workplace looks really different, but you can tell us from sort of a long-term perspective, what's it like for women now? How has it changed? How do we get more women in this workforce? That's a tough one. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> I, my, my philosophy on that is that um, I want to be hired because I'm the best person for the job. And I want to hire people that are best people for the job. And I don't care if they're female or Klingon, right? <laughs> um, you know, the fact that this industry has afforded me an incredible career, I'm very grateful for that. It has been an amazing company to work for. I mean, I started as the product manager for the antivirus product and ended up running one of the largest businesses in, in Intel security. So uh, high tech in general and security specifically has been um, incredibly good to me. And I don't think it was good to me because I was a woman. It was good to me because I was capable. It was good to me because I met my commitments. And when I talk to young women, I say, like, focus on doing the best job that you can, being excellent at whatever you aspire to be, and you will move forward in your career. And if you work for an organization or a company where that doesn't happen, leave. There's thousands of other companies out there would be thrilled to have you if you are excellent at what you do. Now, still to this day, I'm often, you know, maybe the only woman in a room or the only one of, one of two women in a room. Who cares? Like, I, I'm, I am a GM in the room. I am a VP of marketing in the room. I'm a product manager in the room. And I want them to see me in that role, just like I see them in that role that they have, regardless. And, and so, I think being a woman in this industry, it's a great industry because oftentimes I've worked for companies who, who didn't see that as an issue, let alone kind of see it. And I'm very okay with that. I want to be seen as what I do and how good I am at it. And I think that as long as you, you focus on that, I, I think that there are very few places in the world where you won't do well. So, Candace's philosophy on diversity, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. No, once again, I agree with Candace. Uh, I think it's sometimes hard for them. You talked to the high school girls. Yeah. It's sometimes hard because they, they are the best at what they do for them to get across that, that chasm, mm -hmm. if you will, of, of, OK, am I going to pursue this as a field? Because it's not what all my friends are doing. It's not what, yeah. you know. So, But I think that society's changing somewhat, and traditions are changing. And I, for me, I have a little niece. I have a couple little nieces, but one is two and a half, and she hasn't gotten to cyber quite yet. Uh, but the other one looks at, she wants to be a fireman one day, a doctor the next day. She has no limits. And I think that that culture is changing on its own. And they're, they're, they don't see any boundaries. I mean, the other part is that when, when you do talk to, to young women like that, I'm just like, so if you're the only woman in the room, then you're definitely the best woman in the room. And oftentimes, you can be the best in the room regardless of how many are women or men there. Because you're, more, you're generally more motivated to prove your ability as a result of being the only woman there. Like, you, you, you often feel like you gotta work harder and be better so that people recognize that you are outstanding in your job. And I think, you know, for a young woman to go like, wow, I can be the best and I can stand out because I may be the only one like me, that's a great selling tool. Now, in high school, I think you wanna be by, like everybody else, so that's always a challenge in high school. But as you get past that and into college and, and into your career, that, that could be pretty awesome. Yeah. Well, this is just like sports. I think many years ago there wasn't a, a girls volleyball team or a girls softball team. I think it will evolve. Uh, I will say I saw the industry change a few years ago when the line at the bathroom at RSA for us was just <laughs> as long as it is for the guys. Um, it had not been like that uh, until about 2009. That's true. Uh, but look, we want the best and the brightest, and I don't care if that's a tropical fish. right? We want to see what you can do, how you build into the team, what you can bring, uh, how you can use your skills. Uh, I think the focus on women is because it's been so you know, obvious culturally. Yeah. And certainly when I've gone overseas in some very difficult government to government discussions, in many cases, the women are in the back taking notes and it would be you know, my boss and me at the table and uh, people would look at you like, oh, what are you doing here? You get over it, I think it's fun. Yeah. You, you stare them in the eye and, and you compete and you work the meeting and you produce. And that's the key.
You, I'm, I'm gonna, I really am going to give you people a chance to ask a question, but I'm just gonna, I just have to ask one more that kind of builds off this discussion, which is, um, so both of you have been in the geek world now for a while, and uh, when you think of the geek world as it was, say, let's say in the 90s, and your image of a, of, of, of a geek, it was usually a guy, um, he had certain attributes, one of them was largely a pizza box. Um, how has the, the increase in the women in the workforce changed geek culture? And this has implications for recruitment. So what would you say, what's different about being a geek now than it was, say, 20 years ago? You want to answer Absolutely I, nothing. I dress better, so. You know what, absolutely nothing, and I'll prove it. We, uh, we decided to let our huh. cyber ninjas wear jeans to work if they had internal, you know, government, the picture of government is everybody's wearing a, a stodgy <laughs> suit, um, no. We want our folks to, to be comfortable, to feel like they're, they're in a technical team, and so we decided that we'd let them wear jeans. And I remember this ended up requiring a memo. <laughs> and I, I was new to government, and I, I went to the undersecretary, and I said, what? And she said, no, it's, it's the process. Just, you know, we'll, we'll do the process, and we'll follow the right way, and, and I think it'll all work out. Ah, and I wore ripped jeans to the meeting to discuss it, because my point to someone else in the room that I knew opposed it was, are you going to respect me in this room any less because I'm dressed like a geek today than you would if I was wearing something very nice. Because the guys that we and the ladies that we focus on, that we need in a time of crisis, everything you see on the news largely has been handled before it comes on the news. And that's by uh, that team and others across government and private sector. Uh, and I don't think they need to be wearing three-piece suits to do it. We want them to be comfortable. We want them to have their skills. Uh, and, and I'm not allergic to pizza. I walk upstairs to the skips with candy in the big crises. Uh, and I think being a geek, it's no different, the image, uh, but I just think it's cool now. I think the other difference, uh, there, there's one difference, and that is that um, so many of the incidents are high profile. Like, you know, you, when I first started, you had, you had Code Red, and you had a few attacks that were pretty high profile. But now when an attack occurs, the people who understand the attack need to be able to communicate. And you know, I, I had engineers who were brilliant that I worked with that, oh my goodness, I, I probably wouldn't have put them in front of a customer, right? Because you know, they just say what they think. And, and although it's very accurate technically, it may not be the best thing to say to a person under extreme stress and crisis because um, they're a little sensitive during those times. And so I think one of the things we've seen is that the, the more technical people that we have in the organization that have a probability of needing to be in front of the press, in front of our customers, um, building that communication skill set, I think is much more important today than it was in you know, the early 2000s. Because it is more often that somebody who's highly technical may have to go in front of the board, right? You're not gonna put someone without communication skills in front of the board generally. You're not going to put them in front of the press. And so I think in addition to the, the geeky technical skills um, and in the geek speak, which I agree, you, know, you still find candy wrappers and Coke cans in the garbage can at the end of the day, but the skill set I've seen change is many of those highly technical individuals have had to kind of up their communications game because they're called upon to do outbound um, discussions much more often now, given the, the high profile nature of some of the attacks. Okay. Um, do we have questions in the audience? Uh, we have uh, two, one in the front, one in the back. My name is Martin Apple. I'm with the Council of Scientific Society Presidents, and we face a lot of the same issues in terms of getting and recruiting in this talent war for good people. Um, there's two things that I'm interested in. One is, if you're gonna be training people for a job, you're gonna be shortchanging them because if, if you educate them for a particular area of knowledge and they learn all of the, the thinking skills and self problem solving skills as they go, go along for a long period of time, they can then amplify and go forward quite a bit more easily. So I'm worried about any of these programs that look to be to me shortchanging in that sense. And secondly, you keep saying that you have to be an interpreter to the people in the room. Why can't those people be like you instead of you having to interpret to them? Why can't they be like Ernie Moniz at the head of the Department of Energy? Go ahead, I'll let you take this. I mean, I can call. Yeah, it's a 
great question. I could spend an hour, but I'll spend a minute. Um, and thank you. Uh, so to, you know, to Candace's point, you know, I think on the on the um, on the communications, right, it's just very important to get the point out. And some people uh, are very good at that, and some people are highly technical. And there are some people that have absolutely no interest in speaking publicly or explaining things. And, and you don't want to force a skill set. I want people to, and I believe that people are most productive when they do what they love doing. So if you have some scientists that have no desire to go out and speak to the general public, we need other people that can speak. And, and I've learned this uh, in both in corporate and government, um, sort of in a briefing style that's different in government. You sometimes have 30 seconds to convey what happened overnight in what could be a wide-scale attack to a secretary or a deputy secretary that's going to have a microphone in their face in, in 20 minutes. And they have to, and they're smart, they'll get it, but you have to give it to them in a way that has some depth and some impact. And I think that only comes with practice, and there are certain people that just don't enjoy that, so we don't force it. There are plenty of people that are like Candace and me and Jim and others in here that can do both, and there are others that prefer to stay with the media side and do an excellent job of portraying things. And believe me, they have to know what's going on in order to translate it. And then there's the other end of the spectrum that would just prefer to manipulate the bits and bytes of memory all day and not have to deal with going in, in different. It's what you like. Um, that, that's my opinion. That, that's how we run. I like people to focus on what they enjoy most and what they're, that in which they're going to excel the most. Um, to your other question, the concern, and I understand that. It's, it's a real. It's a real point, right? So if you're not going to spend a long time in one place, I think what you're asking is, how do you get the skills then that can help you grow? I think as uh, Under Secretary Spalding and Chris Young design this program, you know, they'll look at that. A lot of this hardcore technical skills that you, and I, having been in both, I'm gonna use this as an example, that you would need in the department or you would need in a hardcore security uh, company uh, are the same. The other skills, the understanding of how marketing engines and research and development engines and budgets and quarters and revenues and shareholders drive one side and the other side. So one side is doing it for the money so they can innovate more and do it for the money. And they keep people happy with the money, but awesome things come out. On the other side, we do a mission. And the money for my side right now is just fuel. I go to the Hill and I ask for money so that we can do our mission. But the hardcore, what you're generating yeah, at the scientific level is not so different but the skills of understanding how to drive a company or how to help a government help its citizens and global partners, those are the very, very different skills that I think you need both. I, I probably wouldn't say anything different. I think um, I, I agree. I think problem solving, understanding financials, communication skills are transferable, regardless of whether you're working in the security industry or the financial sector or the retail industry or the government you know, uh, industry, you know, agency, industry, whatever. It, those core sets of skills translate. Computer science skills, writing code translates, whether you're working for a security company or whether you're working for um, you know, a, a banking company, writing uh, proprietary applications for their internal um, <coughs> systems. So I think many of the skills that you need in this industry does translate. Even if we look at, say, the hacking competitions or war game skills that you might develop as part of a program in this space, you're gonna develop deductive reasoning capability. You're gonna um, create a better set of problem solving skills. I, I can't think of a single job where better problem solving and deductive reasoning wouldn't be an incredibly great set of assets to have. So I think that, that, that we say they're cybersecurity programs because we'll look at those training programs through that lens. 85, 90% of what you get out of those programs would be translatable to a different industry. Great. Uh, we had one in the back. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I don't need that one. Hey, um, on the report Wait, eight you, years you ago. You do because the, um, to get it recorded. Are you, okay, I'm gonna, I apologize to the people in front of me. Um, the report eight years ago, if you remember, had a recommendation in there that the curriculum is needed to be modified, especially in the engineering disciplines where <laughs> that's where the next generation of industrial control systems were coming out, and to have much more cybersecurity knowledge in there. In this study, when you're looking at the gaps or the technology gaps that are out there and looking at ways of how do we get the people with the skills, did you guys see a lot of uh, increase or progress made in getting cybersecurity knowledge incorporated 
into the various uh, disciplines and curriculum out there so that the devices that we buy for the, for the infrastructures, the computers, are embedded with cybersecurity rather than what's now basically a bolt-on add-on? So certainly I think um, writing secure code has, you know, there's been an increased focus on that in curriculums because I think that you, you can't very well teach a coding class without talking about secure code nowadays. But I think, you know, we've also in the past worked with a few universities around um, a piloted curriculum for cybersecurity. And, um, you know, that was a pilot we did a couple years ago, I think, Sal, with a couple universities on the West Coast. And it was interesting. Um, those classes filled up in 15 minutes. You know, and talking to the dean of one of uh, one of those schools, he said it was like a rock concert. You know, the, literally there was a line around the block with kids lined up for that curriculum. So there is demand in in universities for that curriculum and that content by students. I think it's incumbent upon you know security industry and government to work more closely with education to build that out. So I think there's been baby steps in that direction. I don't think we're as far as we need to be. And so I think that's a lot of uh, some of the discussion that we've been having um, both at, I think, our corporate level as well as with Phyllis's organization to try to accelerate that a bit. In terms of like building for industrial and IoT and that kind of stuff, I think that that's going to be a combination of both getting that into curriculums, get, getting the mindset of students coming out of computer science degrees to think about how do I design with security? But it's also incumbent on corporations that are building those devices to make it a priority to develop the architecture with security in mind and then manufacture some level of security capability into the industrial control or, or whatever that device is from the get-go. Adding it after it's already shipped is very difficult. Building it in up front so that it can be managed by a system after the fact, much, much better. So I think it's going to be a combination of industry and education. And, and, and Mike, I'll, I'll embarrass you by just pointing out I've known you for I don't know how many years, and, and thank you for that question because you were a main influence many, many years ago in looking at there's a whole side of securing these systems that is not typical cybersecurity. This is not the protocol that runs the printer. So how do we bring those teams together, the teams that look at the little bits of light that flash on and off that make a circuit open and close that tells you yes or no that makes water flow? And how do we bring those teams together with the guys that are running the IP protocol or standard internet speak to monitor this stuff for miles away? And so one of the areas we look at this a lot is in our industrial control system, sir. And I'll do a shameless plug for this team, um, some of our finest. So it's the ICS, industrial control systems. Those are the systems that run, for example, your electric grid or your water or your lights or your gas, your energy, your natural gas. But looking at those systems that are controlled by electronic signals, where they control mechanical functions. And it's this area is a lot of why we're trying to reorganize how we do a lot of our field response and the National Protection and Programs Directorate and trying to rename ourselves Cybersecurity and Critical Infrastructure and Cybersecurity and uh, Infrastructure Protection Agency. Because that shows the real mission. It takes what Mike is saying, takes these devices that are dictating and running and enabling our fun world and shows their connection to cyber but brings it together. And so some of the talent in that industrial control systems, computer emergency response team, or CERT, uh, that talent is where we have to build, I think. Uh, again, that's part of where we want to add a lot of those rock stars. That's where we're focusing a lot. Because those systems, they're pretty uniform across the different, what they call critical infrastructures, water, gas, oil, electric, et cetera. Uh, but the key is, as Candace said, working with the manufacturers to innovate ways to make them more secure and then working with the operators to please not use the password that came on the package on how you monitor them over the internet. So we monitor this 24-7. There are tens of thousands of these that are exposed. It's public knowledge. We've gone out in campaigns saying, and I've said, if you own or operate one of these systems, you are owned. So let's look at that from a risk management consequence perspective and say, at what point are we going to put what level of security? Not a $100 lock on a $5 item, but let's look at how we assess all this. So it goes from the technical uh, to the cyber side, to the actual IP protocol side, uh, and in many ways toward the risk management corporate side, which again goes to this gentleman's point, why I think it's so important to have both sets of skills. Well, both uh, Candace and Phyllis have day jobs. Uh, you may have suspected that. And we're fortunate that uh, Candace will stay for the panel discussion 
uh, her comments have been great, but Phyllis, for some reason, feels she needs to get back to work. <laughs> and, uh, so please join me in thanking our two speakers. Can I ask the, can I ask the panelists to come up too, by the way? Welcome and thanks for joining us today for our panel discussion on the cybersecurity workforce. Uh, in the report that we did, um, as was mentioned by our speakers, we surveyed eight countries. Australia, France, Germany, Israel, Japan, Mexico, the UK, and the US, to analyze how companies and governments in these countries should approach cybersecurity workforce development. We looked at four dimensions of cybersecurity workforce development efforts, cybersecurity spending, education programs, employer dynamics, and public policies. So with the help of this panel, we're going to dig a bit deeper into these dimensions um, and examine international approaches to cybersecurity workforce development. So without further ado, let me introduce the panel. Um, we've already met Candace in, the, in her opening remarks and have heard um, how cool she is. <laughs> and then next we have Rodney Peterson. Uh, Rodney is the director of the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education at the National Institutes of Standard and Technology. He was previously managing director of EDUCAUSE for, and a senior government relations officer, where he founded and directed the EDUCAUSE Cybersecurity Initiative. Uh, next, we have Simone Petrella. Simone is the chief cybersecurity officer at CyberVista, where she leads product development and delivery of cybersecurity training and education curriculums, as well as workforce initiatives for executives, cyber practitioners, and continuing education. Previously, Simone was a senior associate at Booz Allen Hamilton, where she helped build the firm's Cyber Fusion Center practice. Um, last on our panel, we have Amir Becker, Director of Cyber Co Cooperation at the Embassy of Israel. In this capacity, Mr. Becker jointly serves the Israeli National Cyber Bureau in the office of the Prime Minister and the Embassy's commercial mission. Mr. Becker leads the bilateral engagements between Israel and the U.S. in the cyber realm. So to jump right in, one of the findings from our survey was that only 23% of respondents said that traditional bachelor's degrees were fully preparing students for a career in cybersecurity. So are traditional degrees no longer the best investment for people wanting to enter this field? And how can we improve the quality of our cybersecurity instruction? Perhaps Rodney can. Thank you. Yes, it's an excellent question. And first, I want to thank CSIS for this study and report. You know, one of the things that strikes me in the introduction that is really critical takeaway for this is the reference to the cybersecurity workforce shortfall remains a critical vulnerability for companies and nations. And that vulnerability really implies that this is part of risk management that we don't talk enough about. We talk about technical mitigation, we talk about processes and other software design system vulnerabilities, but the human element, that vulnerability is a critical part of risk management. And I know later in the report, you said that 97% of boards you know, are aware of cybersecurity as an issue. So I hope this report and the work certainly we're doing at the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education will raise awareness and kind of the sense of urgency around cybersecurity workforce as part of the risk management. So specifically to your question about kind of the quantity and quality of what education is producing for cybersecurity workforce, we recognize that as a concern, a challenge, and certainly an opportunity. The, the NICE program has developed a strategic plan that identifies a few goals, but one of them is focused on nurturing a diverse learning community. So I think the first thing I would say is that the traditional pipeline that I think most of us are familiar with of students going through you know, K through 12 school and a university and then to the employer is not the only pathway to getting into cybersecurity. It's an important pathway and it's a long-term pathway that we certainly wanna invest in and improve upon. 
But there are other pathways, including the fact that a lot of cybersecurity professionals could change jobs mid-career and already have a bachelor's degree in a field like psychology and want to get some skills and training, whether it's through a training certification program or through a community college degree, non-degree program. So our other goal in our strategy is to not only nurture this diverse workforce or learning community, but to also accelerate learning and skills development. And then the final pathway is to recognize that uh, the training, the education, the skills development that are happening in our high schools and in our community colleges, training certification providers, are as, of, as much value as what happens in a traditional university setting. So I think we need to think more broadly about that diverse learning community and not just focus on the traditional pipeline that's gonna be certainly an important long-term solution but not the only solution. So in summary, three things I would say about improving quality is to make sure it's employer driven. The way to close the gap between employer satisfaction and what education and training providers are producing is more conversations, more alignment between the two so that educational institutions and training providers are producing what employers need. I think the second thing is what the report references is to more hands-on learning, more uh, actual learning through doing as opposed to just knowledge or lectures, if you will. The combination of knowledge and skills, I think, will increasingly close that gap. And then the third thing, which is really that way to bring employers and education providers together, if you're not familiar, there is a national cybersecurity workforce framework referred to as the NICE workforce framework that really creates that taxonomy, that standard, that way to get employers and education and training providers to be thinking more in common. So I think if we can more focus on what we have in common, our common vision and goals, we can make some progress both in quantity as well as quality. And so these three initiatives and um, talking about cybersecurity as a field in education, is this a unique field in education in terms of how challenging it is to train and develop the workforce, uh, Simone? I do think it's unique in, in some perspectives, and there's a number of reasons for that. And like Rodney said, I think you know one of the interesting points that I found in the report was that 9% of top universities currently offer in the US a cybersecurity major or minor program. Um, which in the grand scheme of university programs is a very small number. And so the question is not only where does that pipeline come from, uh, but how long can we wait to actually get them to the point that they would be ready and willing and capable participants in the workforce, which is a significant amount of time. Um, and so for that reason, you need to really look to alternative methods, whether it's through continuing education, certification programs, um, and retooling current skill sets. One of the reasons among many that that's so difficult is cybersecurity in many ways is a very hard discipline to actually put your finger on what does that skill set require. It's a multidisciplinary field and there are a number of disciplines that you can actually specialize in when you elect to go into cybersecurity. And that's one of the things that makes the field so wonderful. Uh, you can have a analytics or psychology degree and apply that in the field of cybersecurity, but you can also be into forensics or malware analysis and apply very technical skills. Um, but it makes it very difficult to actually create that pipeline or create programs that can address all of those different disciplines. Um, I think another reason that it's been very challenging when we look at the education and the workforce perspective is that the field, relatively speaking, is new. Um, and I don't mean new in the sense that it hasn't been around or hasn't been an issue that's been addressed since the advent of our more connected world, but as far as the profiles received and the amount of time people have had to really explore this as a career field uh, is really fairly recent. And so to be able to, to develop programs to catch up to that, we are playing catch up. Uh, that's one of the reasons that, you know, at, at Cyber Vista, we're I say that we're kind of like the unsexy side of cyber because we're the, we're the education folks and we want to actually help people retool those skill sets. And if universities aren't going to have programs available in a period of time that's going to actually address that need, well then we need to have some gap fillers. Um, and we also need to address a workforce where you can transition people from one career field that's in an adjacent area into the cybersecurity field if they're interested in it. As an example, there's a 9% premium on salaries for IT professionals going into cybersecurity. And to be able to take a lot of those foundational skill sets and give people enough credentials or certifications, whether it's the CISSP or some other skill sets, to be able to get a career in cybersecurity, those are the types of things that we need to be looking at now in addition to higher education. 
I want to touch on your point about creating different programs to um, address all the different disciplines and maybe ask about Israel's experience with that. Um, could you speak about Israel's approach to leveraging, um, Amir, to, speak, uh, to leveraging non-traditional sources of cybersecurity education and training, um, for example, with military service, and how <coughs> Israel is growing their cybersecurity workforce? Sure. So, um, w w as all uh, of us in the room, we are taking cyber very seriously. We understand that uh, this is uh, something that will uh, definitely will uh, uh, change even the future of our state. And uh, about uh, five years ago, we did a big shift in the way that the government is dealing with uh, cyber in Israel. Part of the things is the building new organizations uh, within the government, but part of it is to understand that uh, how important is the uh, phase of uh, uh, the high school students' decision regarding cybersecurity and what they are thinking about it and how they are um, uh, meeting for the first time, um, uh, not through just gaming as we spoke uh, earlier, which is very important, but also through different programs, uh, what it is. And uh, uh, currently, uh, we have a five years uh, plan, and the government is uh, uh, currently uh, funded with a $100 million, which in uh, Israeli terms, it's a lot of money. Um, but not just in Israeli terms, it's a lot of money. And uh, part of it, it's uh, to put it as part of the curriculum of the high school. Um, until the end of the high school, uh, even including uh, the matricular exams. And part of it is to take um, a very interesting uh, uh, challenge uh, to ask students uh, to participate in uh, after-school programs, not part of their official curriculums, uh, uh, in different areas of uh, the state of Israel. And we found out there is a big demand for that. And we uh, uh, promote this uh, program about a few years ago. And Currently, we have uh, almost 1,000 people each year that are participating, participating in that program. It's important not just for their decision regarding what to study during college and uh, at the university. In Israel, it's also very important uh, for the part of the military service, which is a compulsory service. Uh, since the founding of the State of Israel, we have a compulsory service. Uh, I believe that we would like not to have it, but this is the necessities in our neighborhood. and. Um, Recently, we understand that we need to uh, find the most talented people to be part of those technological units, and those programs help us a lot uh, to find those people through competitions, but also through just participating in those programs. Uh, and talking about the military, I'm talking about uh, every year, every boy and girl in Israel at the age of 18 uh, starting their military service, some of them are going to a technological unit. After, uh, Usually it's two years for girls and three years to, uh, for boys, but if they are chosen to be part of the te technological unit, uh, um, it's the same uh, amount of years for boys and girls, by the way, and uh, it's between four to five years. And after four to five years, now they are finishing their military service, and now they are part of the private sector. They can choose what they want to do. Part, some of them are starting the university immediately after that and graduating in computer science and other uh, uh, studies. Some of them, going to the uh, private sector, uh, open uh, their own startups or being a part of uh, large enterprises. And some of them deciding to stay at the government. And uh, I think th this, this decision is a very critical, but it's influenced from all what we did in previous years. And moving to the role of the employer in cybersecurity workforce development, Candice, could you talk about um, our, what can employers do to both provide and shape cybersecurity education and training, and are there any initiatives um, that come to mind that have been successful in developing the cybersecurity workforce? Sure, so I certainly think that you know, the customers that I speak with, um, they're very focused on making sure that they continue to provide training to their security teams. Um, obviously, staying current with skills, staying current with an understanding of you know, both the adversary as well as malware in general um, is is absolutely critical for them to be able to do their jobs. So I think most organizations that have you know, pretty solid security team are putting significant amounts of investment into professional certifications, into continuing education for them, specifically around you know, the computer science skills, those kinds of things. But they're also often doing things like hacking competitions. So they'll actually do you know, a competition internally in the organization where they have you know, different folks within the organization compete with each other, um, war games. 
So setting up teams of people who now are competing against each other in a hands-on, real-time kind of format. Those are skills that they can develop internal to the organization, as well as leveraging external skills through training organizations or universities that have specific um, curriculum around either cybersecurity or skills that would be relevant in cybersecurity. So I think there's tremendous opportunities for, for corporations to, to be part of providing that training. And, and providing that training will also help them retain. Right? So if you're trying to retain your talent, giving them an opportunity to continue to evolve their skill sets is a great way to help with retention. Yeah, I want to, um, because that runs counter to some of the concerns that I've heard from employers, but one of the interesting hi um, highlights of our survey is that training is very important. Um, I guess, what would you say to an employer that says, you know, if I train my workers, then they're going to leave, they're just going to be more valuable to other, um, to other companies? I think um, many times that's a function of creating a work environment where people want to be. I mean, I think, I think Phyllis made an incredible point earlier, which is, you know, she may not be able to pay as much as some of the private sector organizations, but they have a mission. And the culture of that organization and the mission of that organization becomes the motivation for the people that go to work for her. And so I think creating an environment that fosters kind of that sense that I am part of something bigger than my current role or my role alone is an outstanding way to get your people to stay. And if you think about, you know, in the millennials, social conscience is, um, is a big part of what makes them tick. And so thinking about how, you know, in cyber, part of what we do every day is help people and corporations protect what's most important to them in the digital world. And if you are a person where social conscience is important to you, being a part of an organization that makes that a priority is a great reason to stay in your job. One of, one of my favorite quotes personally is one from Richard Branson when he talks about, you know, train your people like you want them to actually be able to leave, um, but treat them so that they want to stay. Absolutely. And I think that there's a number of levers from the employer perspective that often speak to that, how do you treat them so they want to stay? And if you're working for DHS and there really is a mission there, that is you know, certainly one aspect that can be a motivating factor as we talk about how employers can pull those levers. Yes, there is the salary in the private sector and it, there's a time and place for people's careers where that is gonna be their primary concern, mm -hmm. the further education opportunities. And so retention is about so much more than just giving someone a training opportunity and then showing them that they could have a career path. It's saying here's the career path or here are the things that you can actually achieve by having these skills. At some point, money stops being the motivator, yeah. right? It's all the other stuff about the organization that you work in and the role that you have that motivates you to stay in that company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I guess to pivot to um, governments and uh, companies in their role, um, turning back to Israel, uh, from an outsider's perspective, Israel is doing very well in this front. You said they're investing $100 million in this. They have um, high school programs and their political leaders are engaged. Um, what problems has Israel encountered with cybersecurity workforce development and what still needs to be done on that front? So, uh, yes, it's a great question because um, currently um, there is a very unique uh, situation regarding Israel in the cybersecurity uh, uh, sector. One of the very unique things is that in many parameters, uh, Israel is second just to the, U to the U.S. Uh, in this uh, uh, sector, mainly from the uh, private sector uh, perspective. Uh, part of it is the fact that uh, in Israel there are about 250 cybersecurity companies. It's just one third of what U.S. have. But Still, in Israeli terms, it's uh, really a big uh, a, a, a challenge because those companies always need more uh, people to work within. And uh, another thing is that uh, because it's a uh, global challenge it's, and it's a global uh, a, a world, not just regarding the workforce itself, also the fact that a lot of multinational companies are part of the Israeli uh, a, a ecosystem. And the, Israeli ecosystem, uh, just in a nutshell, is part of it is the academia, part of it is what uh, the, we just talked about human capital, but part of it is also the private sector, and we are very proud of what we created. And I think that our biggest challenge is to keep the uh, Israeli ecosystem strong with all the components that are part of it, together with all the multinational companies that are involved in the Israeli uh, 
cybersecurity uh, sector uh, in the last few years? Um, in the Obama administration yesterday put out a new directive outlining different agency roles and responsibilities to cyber attacks. And now while this isn't directly related to the workforce per se, I'm wondering how can these agencies um, deliver on their the initiatives in the directive to respond given uh, a workforce shortage? So what is government, what is the US government doing to address the shortage um, to facilitate hiring or maybe even outsourcing some of these um, cybersecurity capabilities? Yeah, so the, the title of the directive is Cyber Incident Coordination, and, and my first reaction to that is, well, that's an operational concern or maybe a policy issue, but like all of these issues, when you peel back behind the scenes, it takes a skilled workforce to make things happen. And there's a couple roles kind of called out in the directive that I think are obvious. One is incident handlers or people who are identifying incidents and therefore need to share them. Uh, a secondary one that's really called out is about restoring and you know recovering from incidents. And many of us know that business continuity role is important. And just focusing on those two roles for a moment, that is part of the workforce that is quite frankly in demand. Your report talks about intrusion detection as a very high demand skill, and we don't know the incidents until we can discover them, right? And so I think it is directly related to both the directive in terms of how it's going to happen and who is going to do the work. What's even more interesting, though, when you drill down into the directive and it talks about the implications of a cyber incident, the impact, in other words, it lists these type of work roles, business and operational continuity, adverse financial impact, privacy protection, liability risks, compliance issues, communications to affected users, and external affairs, including media and Congress. Those are work roles that a variety of people are gonna to have to play to carry out that directive effectively. And I think it's actually a great illustration of where our nice workforce framework is moving to recognizing you know, quite frankly, cybersecurity is everyone's responsibility. I know that seems trite, and that's part of our message for Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And in fact, our vision for NICE is a digital economy that is enabled by a skilled and knowledgeable cybersecurity workforce. So there really are a variety of people, including lawyers, policymakers, financial people, and others who are going to have a cybersecurity responsibility, even in the context of cybersecurity incident management, if you will. So in the fall, we plan to publish the next version of the NICE workforce framework, and in addition to seeing seven categories of work, 30 specialty areas, and the corresponding knowledge and skills and abilities, you're going to also see work roles added. And that's precisely what the federal government is doing in its assessment of our cybersecurity workforce and gaps, is looking at the work roles that are performed both within the IT organization and outside with respect to cybersecurity. And so um, that kind of is a good tie into my next segment about different future skills and technologies and how, um, how these skills will develop over time given where the industry as a whole is heading. So um, Simone, if you were advising someone just about to enter this field and what, they, what skills should they learn to be competitive um, given the technological developments and how should they acquire them, what would you say about the skills and then the process? Yeah, sure. It's, it's a tough question because, you know, the, the technologies and automations that are being developed are so vast, but they're also a patchwork. And so when I, you know, talk to, to folks who are looking to enter the field or if they're looking to even transition from maybe an a adjacent IT field, I tend to focus on some of the areas that require the higher order levels of analysis or data comprehension or critical thinking. It's still applying it to a technical means, but as Phyllis and Candace mentioned earlier, it's getting to a point that we want to be able to actually separate the noise and actually focus on what's important. And the skill sets that we need for people is to actually look at those items that are important and allow technologies to be developed that can help separate that wheat from the chaff and then just focus on the important components. And it's tough because we don't want to pigeonhole people into only one skill set. We don't want someone to say you only are capable of doing incident response because the reality is you're going to have to potentially communicate that. You are potentially going to have to bring that up to your executive team. Uh, but you need those foundations. And I think that professional certifications uh, in the landscape that we have today are a really integral point for people that are looking to, to break into that field. And they set that baseline of knowledge that 
despite what technologies get developed and despite what we automate, serves as a way for people to understand and employers in particular to understand what is your baseline level of knowledge. Just as an example, there are 49,000 open jobs currently for CISSPs. And in the US alone, there are 65,000 CISSP holders. Um, so you can see how that might be a problematic in unbalance uh, in, in the workforce. And so being able to actually address some of those current needs and then just transition as technologies change is going to be absolutely critical. You know, when we talk about those, those skill sets and we talk about how do we evolve, one of the things that we see in cybersecurity, and you see it in all fields, but I think you see it most acutely in cybersecurity because it changes so frequently. The evolution rate is just exponentially higher than you would see in other disciplines. And so there's this need for continuity and consistency in training. Uh, and so the skill sets that you might develop coming out of one program aren't necessarily going to be what you need to be sustainable. Um, and that's going to be true as we continue to you know, advance technologies and create more opportunities to actually automate some of these basic processes. And as, as we advance these technologies and move towards a more automated cybersecurity environment, um, one of the interesting findings from our report was that nine out of 10 respondents believe that technology can partially compensate and these, um, these types of technologies can partially compensate for a gap in cybersecurity skills. So is this, is this the, the magic bullet? Is the, can that solve all of our cybersecurity problems? Or um, how, how, will, how will the cybersecurity skills shortage evolve in the future? Yeah. So I think I would probably love the gross margin on a silver bullet, but I don't, I don't think there actually is a silver bullet, right? So I think that automation can begin to address a capacity issue. And so if I, if I think back to kind of early in my time in, in security, most of the customers that I would talk with were like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not automating processes associated with security because you know, my, my neck is on the line if something goes wrong. So if I automate the testing of uh, patches, or I automate the testing of a signature file, or I automate some critical process associated with security and it goes south, um, you know, I'm, I'm probably in the unemployment line tomorrow. And so that's not going to happen. And at that point, I would say that the security industry as a whole was still relatively immature in the early 2000s. And so customers were still building kind of that trust and respect of uh, security um, product providers. And I think we've come a tremendous distance in terms of um, the credibility of security products and the confidence that customers and agencies have in those products. And we're now at a point where the conversations we're having with customers is, you know, there are certain things I'm okay with automating, right? So I've set up automated test rigs to test signature files for my core answers. I've created automated test rigs for operating system patch updates so that I'm not having a person um, set in front of a machine and click buttons through a process to test whether or not something's going to blow up in my environment. So we've evolved, I think, from the, <coughs> the user or consumer's perspective to being OK with automating what I tend to call some of the more janitorial tasks. On the other hand, you know, there are many tasks that still require you know, gray matter. You, you need a person in a chair looking at a screen, going through data, trying to figure out which data is most critical or relevant to a potential incident. I mean, you could literally be looking at gigabytes of data, trying to figure out which pieces of data are associated with an event. Yes, there are probably some algorithms that we could build in computers to sift through that at the initial level. But when it comes down to the final determination of which of those bits is associated with an attack, what that attack did, how did it get into the environment, um, what systems did it touch, did it exfiltrate any data or information out of the organization, how do we remediate the damage that it may have done and remove it from the environment, Many of those types of tasks, you need a person to be doing that. It's very difficult to get a computer to be able to like, do those levels of assessments. So I think from an automation perspective, there's lots that we as vendors can do to begin to build automation into the security process, into the security products that we deliver to market. But there will always be roles 
that require humans to be part of the intervention. And I think we can also build into those programs things that make those tasks easier. So how do I get the systems to do that first level of filtering on those gigabytes of data, right? So I know that this was just a, is a standard call. I know that this was um, you know, a standard policy that was applied by the, uh, the security program. But my goodness, normally that application doesn't inject that process. And, and there's an event in here that it injected that process. So that's odd. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, having somebody see that point and this point and that point, well, they can tie those together intellectually and say those three things together equal bad when any one of them individually might not have raised a flag. So I think automation can play a role, but there will always be a critical need for people who, who have deductive reasoning and problem solving and critical thinking skills. You know, I think your automation finding may be one of the most new and original findings in the report. A lot of things, you know, have surfaced before. And I would definitely think it is a solution, but not the solution. And I can just give a couple examples of my own experience where I think we are mitigating the workforce issue through automation or through um, efficiencies, if you will. So one is in the federal government, for, for good reasons, we're all required to take mandatory cybersecurity awareness training. And traditionally, that training would happen in a classroom like this with a live instructor presenting material. We have online training um, that is available that kind of eliminates that need for that physical person to be present. Not to say that that isn't a workforce need in some settings, but that automation, I think, has led to efficiencies and really addressed a workforce issue. The other example that comes to mind is whether it's account generation, password changes, and all the rest that used to require a physical person at the help desk to help change, we've now begun to automate that in ways that are increasing efficiency and arguably security in some ways as well. But what I'd also remind you is behind those automated efforts is innovation and creativity. And that's a whole other workforce we need to make those things happen. So I agree it has efficiency. I think it's a really important finding that you've made, uh, but it's not the silver bullet. It's part of the overall strategy we need to keep in mind. Something I used to see in uh, some, some financial institutions and retailers that we would consult with is that technologies were great and they wanted to automate a lot of functions, but the reality is that there needed to be humans who could evaluate the uses of those technologies and how they efficiently and effectively worked together. Uh, and the reality was it came down to, in some cases, a cost-benefit analysis. So if you have, if you're making a large investment in some technologies that accomplish 20% of what you need it to do, but it turns out it's capable of doing 80% and you just don't have the people who are able to utilize that technology in the right way or they're not working properly with other technologies you've invested in, then the technology, as good as it could be, isn't as effective. You need humans to actually help set those processes up in your organization as the customers uh, in order to make them work. From a government perspective, uh, we definitely take the same approach that just, just was described about need to uh, make more uh, process automated and uh, to understand exactly where the uh, human is uh, most critical. But also, we take another approach that uh, differentiate, differentiate in a way from the, uh, the needs of the national level from the large enterprises' needs, mainly because of the uh, price of a mistake and the uh, impact that might be uh, made for a nation uh, from the national uh, security perspective. And uh, taking those two approaches together, uh, we're working uh, very close with the uh, leading R&D uh, centers in Israel within the leading universities and together with the private sector in Israel to understand how to automate it as much as we can and to find together what are the uh, critical places to keep human uh, leading the processes. Great. Well, I think we have time for some questions if we want to, anyone in the audience has some, or I can, I can take moderator's prerogative <laughs> and start off with one of my own. Um, being that we're in Washington and um, I feel like this and we're in the height of political season, there's been a lot of rhetoric about, um, you know, maybe closing some of our borders and um, with immigration policies. And I was wondering how would that affect the tech community and particularly cybersecurity where diversity is so important? How do you see um, this uh, rhetoric or some of these um, proposed policies having an effect on um, workforce development and the ability of employers to um, hire a diverse workforce. 
Me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so let me think carefully about this answer. <laughs> <laughs> that was Tom Clarence's joke. So um, what I would say is that certainly, I think, um, should, should the country decide to go in that direction, that it will make it even more critical for us to work with universities to build an internal pipeline of technical talent coming out of university. Um, I think we have seen over the course of the last several years uh, a lower than we would like percentage of students coming out of university with engineering and computer science degrees. And I think industry in general has looked to the international community to make up the capacity delta in terms of leveraging people from overseas to fill their talent, you know, their, their roles. I think if we're going to limit accessibility to that broader talent pool, then it'll be incumbent on us as, as really as a country and as a um, corporate and government community to make it a number one priority to start developing more programs that will facilitate an increase in technical degree programs. I'll just give a quick example, a nonpartisan answer, I might add, uh, related to the scholarship for service program that Phyllis referred to earlier. Uh, that is one of the ways the federal government is incenting students to both receive a degree and get their tuition room and board and get some fees paid in return for government service. And historically, that uh, eligibility has been limited to U.S. citizens. And under the Cybersecurity Enhancement Act of 2014, that was opened up a little bit more. But the point is that because of the demand, whether it's in industry or in government, we're seeing both the domestic U.S. students as well as graduate students, you know, taken pretty quickly into the workforce, which we hear from our graduate and Ph.D. producing institutions. It leaves them a shortage of people who can pursue master's degree and PhDs who in return will be the professors and the teachers in the future. And so whether it's a result of immigration policy or even our own domestic policies with respect to the pipeline, because the bottom line is to get that scholarship for service and then go to work for the government and get a clearance, it's obviously heavily favored in, in the favor of US citizens. One of the most interesting statistics I found in the report was you know, we said there are 7% of top universities that have an undergraduate degree program, but there's only a third of universities that have a graduate program. And of that third, 68% of the student population is made up from, from foreign students. Mm -hmm. um, and so while I don't necessarily have a comment on, on the immigration side of things, um, I do think that that's very interesting mm -hmm. and troubling uh, mm -hmm. when you think about the diversity of perspectives that are coming through those programs today, and if that's all of a sudden stopped, um, I think it tells me, one, that we do need more programs that can actually address the need because that's woefully inadequate, uh, but also that we, we should continue to get that diversity of perspective. This is a worldwide problem. Uh, there are no borders in cyberspace, and so in, unless you're going for a clearance or something else, uh, I think it's extremely important that we get that diversity of you know perspectives, whether it's from looking at different adversaries and having a different perspective because of the geopolitical situation or otherwise? Of course, I'm not the person to uh, comment on the immigration <laughs> uh, <laughs> issue, but I can, I can share with you the fact that in Israel, there are uh, 25 uh, US uh, R&D cybersecurity centers of US companies, meaning that uh, it's the connection are very tight. Um, and those companies decided to be in Israel and uh, sometimes it's just with uh, front office, with just a few people doing scouting uh, for new Israeli technologies. Sometimes it's thousands of people working for a U.S. company uh, in Israel. Uh, even sometimes it's the global center of cybersecurity for that company. And I think this is uh, fascinating. Any questions? Um. With the comment that you made about 68% of the students in the advanced degree programs are coming from overseas, the question then that it's begged to be asked, is that is that because there's not enough U.S. students applying for those programs? And then the question would be, why is that? Or are they being beaten out by the more talented folks coming from overseas? In other words, why is there only 34% of U.S. students in those advanced programs? 
Yes, yeah, so what I certainly hear from chancellors, presidents, and deans at colleges and universities is because many of their undergraduate students in particular uh, can leave college and get high paying jobs with the knowledge and skills that they obtain in those four years that there's not the incentive for them to return for a master's or PhD. And so there's a talent shortage, if you will, in the graduate school pipeline in and of itself. I think secondly is the incentives aren't necessarily there as well because when you talk about leaving the government to go to a higher paying job that is in um, industry or elsewhere, well the same is true to be a teacher or a faculty member which pays even less than working in the government. And so it's really hard to attract really talented researchers and faculty if we're not offering competitive salaries. And you just look at higher education as the example and you contrast you know, what we pay for um, doctors and medical school professors and others who are you know, highly skilled and highly in demand. We reward them with high salaries, but we don't reward the computer science professor or the business professor or you know, the person who's teaching cybersecurity across the curriculum in the same way. And ultimately, a lot of these programs are fairly new. And so, like the rest of the field, there is some level of marketing. I've, I've said in the past, cybersecurity has a marketing problem. And we need to be more aggressive about recruiting people into the field, whether it's because they're taking that educational route or whether they're actually pursuing it as a career field. Um, and so, regardless of whether it's because there's just not enough demand from, from domestic US students or whether it's that they're being weeded out, I still think that that problem could be solved by continuing to really actively recruit and show people the path that they can have by selecting a career in cybersecurity. Yeah, to, to go off of that, I think it's also um, actively recruiting and doing that at a younger age and letting that career path be known at a younger age. I think that that's an advantage where um, some other countries are um, doing that better than, than mm -hmm. we are right now. Um, as a computer science student and a millennial, I'm curious from any of you all, um, what do you find the most frustrating, I guess, uh, aspect of recruiting specifically um, the millennial generation? Wow. Um, so I'll, I'll throw something out there. So I think part of it is that um, um, melding a millennial workforce with a, a workforce of previous generations can be challenging, right? So many of the folks that are in industry today are you know, part of the end of the baby boomers or I guess Gen, Gen Ys, was that next? <laughs> I, get my, I get my alphabet mixed up occasionally on the generations. And so they have a very different perspective. Um, many don't use social media as often. Um, many um, still want to pick up the phone or walk down the hall and talk to someone rather than instant message. And so you, you end up with a little bit of, of um, not culture clash, but a, a different approach to communication, a different approach to work. And I know as a manager of, of, of large groups, um, that becomes one of my management challenges is how, how do I get these these diverse generations who really approach communications and work differently sometimes to find common ground so that they can successfully execute on a project together. Because the reality is I'm not going to put all millennials on one project and all you know, um, baby boomers on another. It, they're going to bring different skill sets to that same project and I need both or I need three or four generations in a project. One, because it brings diversity of thought. Right? They have different experiences, they have different approaches to problem solving. That gets you a better result. But with diversity, you also get difference of opinion. You get debate, you get conflict. And as a manager, you have to figure out how to kind of like bring that team together. So you know, oftentimes you end up being you know, teacher, coach, uh, playground referee, you know, so, so as a manager, I'd say that's been one of my bigger challenges is not just with the millennials, but in how to create a cohesive team that is represented across multiple generations. 
So I have two daughters that are millennials, so I have to be careful what I say about what <laughs> frustrates me about millennials. So I want to actually turn it around a little bit, because I'm less frustrated about millennials. I am optimistic and see lots of promise and opportunity. I'm more frustrated by the workforce in which they're trying to enter, that's trying to build models and systems off of, as we heard Phyllis and others said, previous generations who stay there a long time and have traditional ways of coming to and from work every day. So I think we need to recognize that millennials are perhaps going to stay for a shorter period of time than a lifelong career. When you talk about diversity of thought, that's a good thing. You know, if they're coming in and out of industry to government or from one company to another, they're bringing diverse experiences and other ways of doing and thinking that I think is very valuable to the organization. I think secondly, we need to think, you know, in the job, in the federal government as a great example, as part of the new federal cybersecurity workforce strategy released last week, is job rotations is a good thing. It's not always a career ladder where you advance, 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 more pay, more pay, more pay, but just getting a different experience working across a department in another agency, getting in another assignment, working all together, you know, a DHS employee that comes to NEST. I think that job rotation keeps millennials engaged, uh, adds value to the organization, and that's just the new normal. Could I add one more point? I'm sorry, but uh, millennials often, there's a couple of things. One, they like to work from home, right? They like that diversity to work from wherever, whatever environment makes them feel comfortable. I think that they, they generally like social causes. They like organizations that are socially conscientious. I mean, could cybersecurity be a better field for them? Mm. I mean, it's all about trying to make the world a safer place at some level. I've never worked in an organization that was more geographically diverse than the one I'm in right now with Intel Security. We have, we have a large workforce that works from home. We have people spread out all over the globe. You know, and if I look at my team alone, I think I have three or four Soho workers. I have people who work in, in you know, Europe, in several locations in the US. It gives them maximum flexibility to live where they want to live to get the balance, work-life balance they want. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, not that there aren't long hours. We have plenty of times when it's you know it's a 17-hour day, not a you know eight-hour day. But but at the same time, it gives them a lot of the elements that they're looking for in a job. You can find in cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I jumped in. No, I, I think that makes complete sense and. I'm going to pull a Rodney because yeah. my biggest frustration is, is actually a strength for the millennials and a frustration but a good motivation for us as the employers because all the millennials I have hired over the years are so motivated and so ambitious and it is contingent upon us in the workforce to provide them the environment to excel and succeed and that is a greater burden, a good burden, but it is a greater burden on us as the employers to provide those opportunities it makes our organizations better. Uh, we are more successful when we create those environments to give people those opportunities and to feed their ambitions and their motivations. I have found millennials to be some of the most passionate creative thinkers that we have worked with and they are approaching problems in a way that I think a lot of their predecessors may not have looked at the problems because they were looking through a paradigm of, of a fairly traditional model. Um, and so, you know, the frustrations ultimately that it just makes it more work for, for us, mm -hmm. um, but that's a good thing. I am, I am so happy to have that challenge as we kind of look to this. That's just a contingent of, of the workforce that's so eager to learn, and if you give them that opportunity, they will eat it up, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's really something that we should be taking advantage of and providing them the, the infrastructure and perspectives in order to the, for them to take advantage of it. I have nothing to add. <laughs> uh, well, I guess if there's no more questions from the audience, um, I'd like you all to join me in thanking our panel for their uh, time and insights here today. Thank you. Thank you.